Beloved in the Lord, you are welcome to the service. I love you. And uh, I know that, um, yeah, today is um, Palm Sunday. Um, and uh, it is a day that I know that we all expect to really receive from the Lord, and I believe strongly that God is going to speak to us. Amen. I'm just, I'm going to really um, bring to you um, a message uh, from Matthew chapter 21, 1 to 11. But before then, I will draw your attention to what really uh, Jesus said before he really embarked on this journey. Amen. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 20, 17 to 19. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Amen. Amen. Beloved, I mean, there are times in our lives that we know certain things are going to happen, and we make decisions not to really go ahead. Interestingly, for Jesus, he knew why he was going into Jerusalem. He knew what was going to happen, yet he made a decision to go. Hallelujah. It's, I, I don't know, but I don't think it's an easy decision. I mean, when especially we know uh, what is ahead of us, we see Paul do the same thing. And it is those who have come to the... You know, one thing I want us to understand is that in Luke uh, chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus laid something for us, and he said that, look, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. We need to have that at the back of our minds, that in being, I mean, calling ourselves disciples, and many of us call ourselves disciples, but we don't really uh, measure up to it. Hallelujah. Because he gave us, the first step is to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. We all know that. But many of us accept our, the Lord as our, our Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but we don't go to the next step. We don't do anything. We stay put and we don't really grow. Hallelujah. We need to also understand, interestingly, that um, Jesus is uh, always getting his, the people that are following him to really understand that in following him, you will have to count the costs. In Luke chapter 14, 26 to 28, he says that, can you quickly do that? Yeah. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Which year? What, what, what's Jesus saying? Do you know that when you were making your decision to follow Christ, this was there, and you made a decision, you still made a decision? I know church people don't like this. Yeah, I know. I, 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 amen. Can I go on? Oh, you want a new topic. Okay, let's go for a new topic. I mean, the 10 steps to make money. You see? That brings a lot of excitement. Hallelujah. Which one do you want this morning? This one? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That's not my fear. <laughs> yeah, go back to Luke chapter 14. Yeah. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus here is setting certain standards. The question to ask is that, 
Did we consider this when we came to him? Did we? Because I believe that if we did, we would not really complain some of the times the way we complain. Hallelujah. He has given us all these so we will know beforehand what we are signing up for. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Wouldn't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Because he says that if you don't, what is going to happen that you start but you never finish? You, can, you don't complete. How many of us came to Christ but we walked away when crisis came? I was sharing with some people this morning that yesterday someone said something to me. He said that Jesus has disappointed him. I said, look, please, I, I, I was begging, please never ever say that. He never disappoints. I don't know the kind of Jesus you are serving. But the Jesus I know never disappoints. We may think he's disappointing. When people thought that he was slow uh, in 2 Peter 3, 9, he said that, look, I am not slow as you understand slowness. Hallelujah. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So the fact that you see slowness in your mind, it's your mindset, it's the way you are thinking, it's the way you are looking at things. But if you look at things with Jesus' eyes, in Jesus' perspective, he is not slow. He is not delaying. The fact that you are looking for something and you haven't gotten it doesn't mean that God is, a, is not a promise keeper. He is a promise keeper. When he says it, he will fulfill it. Didn't he say that God is not a man that he should lie? Not a son of man that you... Look, the point I am trying to make is that if we are not careful and we don't know why we signed up, we don't know why we came to him, we will make those decisions, we will say those things. And many have come to Christ and could not really continue. But Bible says that those who will stand till the end shall be saved. The fact that you start doesn't mean that you'll finish. What did Paul say? Let's go to uh, see what Paul said in Acts chapter 20, 22 to 24. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of us are in church and our only aim is not make, to make money, but to finish the race and make it to heaven? You came with a wrong mindset. You came with a wrong motive. You follow Christ with a wrong motive. And that is why we keep complaining. We keep doing all kinds of things. But the Bible says that, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim, my only I said, my only, what is your aim in Christ? Why did you come to church? Why did you give your life to Christ? If you can't answer that question correctly, I'm telling you, you are in the wrong place. You don't have to come here. You don't belong. Hallelujah. Because you need to be able to answer that question. Hallelujah. If you can't, and I'll give you time this morning to really answer that question. Because you need to reflect. Many of us have come to Christ the wrong way because we heard wrongly. Somebody told you, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you come to Christ, you have a nice husband. Yeah, so you are in church. Because Christians are good. They won't beat you. Amen. Amen. So when you come to and you get a nice guy in church and he begins to really misbehave, then you say, yeah, but God is a liar. He deceived me. Did you ask God? Hallelujah. Yeah, you thought that, oh yeah, yeah uh, I mean, church girls are good. Yeah, so yeah, ch- oh, for church girls, yeah. 
They, are, they don't give you wahala. They are not, well, how do you say that thing? Slay whatever. Okay, yeah, church girls are not slay queens. So, yeah, they are good. But there are slay queens in church. Hallelujah. No, we need to be, listen, we need to face the reality. You know, there are people, when they come to church, they want to hear what they want to hear. And unfortunately, Bible says that there's coming a time where people will gather around themselves, those who will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. I'm not telling you what you want to hear. I'm telling you what God wants you to know. The amen this morning is so cold. Listen, is this not uh, Palm Sunday? I thought it was... Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the eyes. And then we, I thought you were going to put your cloth down and everything and jubilate. But it looks like this message is not nice. Are we here? Yes. Do we want to hear? Yes. All right, okay. Uh, then I'll go on if you want to hear. <laughs> yeah. My, my, uh, she's good, eh? For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Mm. <laughs> Hallelujah. They will not put up with sound doctrine. Are we in that time? Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their are in the ears want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Mercy. And because of that, they have their own pastors now. Which again, Bible spoke about in Jude. Hallelujah. Jude 1, is it 4? Let's see Jude 1, 4. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are very good people. The Bible says they are what? What do they do? You know all pastors are pastors today. You don't have to. It's not every church you have to go to. Amen. Amen. You see how much I love you? Okay. Then don't get angry. <laughs> Why are you angry? <laughs> Amen. Let's go to Paul. In Acts chapter 20. Verse 24 says that, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to look at Jesus and look at Paul and look at you and me. Now, Jesus said that I am going into Jerusalem and this is what awaits me. What awaits me is arrests, beatings, and crucifixion. But nothing can stop me. I know what is ahead of me. I know it's not easy. I know it's not cheap. I know there is suffering. I know there is challenge. I know there is beatings. I know I'm going to suffer uh, the most shameful death in his time that is being hanged on a tree. Because Bible says that cursed is anyone who is hanged on a tree. It was like you being a criminal and being crucified. And he was going to face that kind of death. And he knew it. Yet he went. He knew the challenges ahead of him. But he did not shy away from it. He did not say that, oh yeah, but this is hard. Yes, Bible says that when he went to even Gethsemane, 
he really was so sorrowful, even to the point of death. And he could even ask his father that if, I mean, let this car pass me, but not my will, let your will be done. That's how tough and challenging it was. Even when he had entered, the things that he had to go through, beloved, was not easy. In your Christian walk, in your Christian life, what have you suffered? Why have you given up? Why do we give up? Why do we sometimes... We may get to the point that Jesus got to, like in Gethsemane. We may be sorrowful because of certain things that we go through. But we have to know the God we serve. We have to be prepared because if you know what is ahead of you, it doesn't mean that when it comes, you are going to be comfortable with it. Jesus himself, Bible says that endure the cross. He didn't enjoy it. There are certain things we have to go through as Christians which we will not enjoy. But it doesn't mean that the fact that we are not enjoying it, we have to give up. No, we have to keep going. Hallelujah. If you are walking on the narrow road, Hallelujah. It's not, go- it's not going to be easy because on the narrow road, someone will step on your leg. Because it's, cr- I mean, you know, it's narrow. There are times you are driving and the road is so narrow that you have to park for someone to go. On the narrow road, you have to really sometimes let go of your rights. Look, if I'm driving on a narrow road, which I do a lot of times when you go to the field, because, I mean, I go to the bush all the time. I, I, my work takes me there. And when you are driving, you get to places, the road is so narrow that you can't have two cars pass each other. So one has to, and someone has to make that sacrifice. Else you will crash. Someone has to make that sacrifice. So someone has to park so that someone will go. And if you don't make that sacrifice... Maybe it's better to waste maybe five minutes for the other one to pass than to stay there for, I don't know, you can even lose your car. Maybe you can even lose your life. Hallelujah. So there are decisions we would have to make on this journey. The decision of sacrifice, a decision where you will say that, look, indeed, this is hard, but I have to go through it. Jesus himself said, he said that if you are coming, count the cost. If you want to be my disciple, count the costs. If you want to follow me, and majority of us as Christians, we don't go through discipleship. We don't go through nurturing. We say, we say some words, I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that's even a lie because we say it with our mouths, but our hearts are far away from it. And we really just feel good about it. Yeah, but I gave my life to Christ. When? You said some words. I'm not saying that it's not right to say it. But what I'm trying to say is that say it from your heart. Don't say some words because somebody says say some words after me. Don't. Be sure. Yield. Hallelujah. Because if we don't come to that point, we will say words that we don't mean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, if he was persecuted, we will be persecuted. If he, people really went after him, John 15, 20, then we will also go through certain things. And I want you to be aware that coming to Christ doesn't mean that there is nothing to go through. Paul understood it. So in the next chapter of Acts chapter uh, 21, uh, Paul made a statement. When Agabus, uh, really, uh, when uh, prophet Agabus said that, whose belt is this? And he tied himself and he said, the one whose belt, uh, the one who owns this belt is going to be, I mean, tied in this way and everything. Paul was not. They were trying to ask him not to go. But they forgot that in in chapter 20, he has made it clear that, look, the Holy Spirit has told me what I'm going to face. What has he told you? 
What has Jesus told you that you're going to face in this walk with him, in this journey with him? What has he told you? That everything is going to be fine? That there's not going to be any persecution? That there's not going to be any challenge? Since you came to Christ, have you gone through any persecution? Have you gone through any challenges? Maybe not, but it's coming. Hallelujah. Because everyone will face one persecution or the other. Our persecutions might not be the same. My persecution will not be your persecution. Your persecution may not be my persecution, but there will be a persecution. If he said it, it means it will happen. Hallelujah. Sometimes we want only the good things that Jesus said. And we put a timeline on it in such a way that uh, if it doesn't happen within the timelines we have really set for ourselves, then we, f- we think Jesus has failed. But the, the key thing you need to understand is that you didn't say it. He said it. And he also said that you go through persecution. He also said that um, he's not slow as you understand slowness. So we need to put all these together to know that the journey uh, of faith is not a journey that uh, you determine how you want to walk it or live it. It's determined by what God wants us to really go through. Amen. Amen. So Jesus knew what he was going to go through, yet he was willing and ready to go uh, into Jerusalem. Amen. Hallelujah. Beloved in the Lord, I I think um, a lot of us make a lot of mistakes when we come to Christ. And I, uh, this morning, uh, it, it's, it's really, really very important for me for us to understand that as we have come to him, there are certain challenges we are going to face. And um, we have to have that kind of mindset that when they come, we ought to go back to him. Hallelujah. Amen. Sometimes when challenges come, we go to the wrong people for solutions. Where do you go when you are in trouble? Who do you seek uh, counsel from? Many believers seek ungodly counsel from unbelievers when they are faced with crisis. Hallelujah. And it's very dangerous. Very, very dangerous because some of us the people we go to do not share the same faith with us. And I'm not saying that um, then, I, uh, if that is what it means, then probably uh, I'm working in the bank. I have to leave because uh, the boss is not a Christian. Hallelujah. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when you come to face challenges in your walk with the Lord, who do you go to? When you are facing crisis of life, who do you go to? Because one thing we need to understand is that he is in control. He is in control. If we come to understand that he is in control and he knows all things, we will go to him. Hallelujah. We will go to him. There could be great challenges that will come our way. But who do we go to? Who is your source? Hallelujah. Many of us do not know our source. Some also, uh, the way we think, uh, what we think uh, is our source is not our source at all. Do you realize that Jesus himself mentioned many things that we'll go through in the end times? And do we pay attention to them? Are we aware? Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 24. It's all part of the end times. Amen. Amen. And let's read from verse uh, 9 to 13. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. 
At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end, there will be challenges. And there will be moments in your life, in this walk with the Lord, that you would probably want to give up. But Bible says that you have to stand till the end. There will be tough times. There will be perilous times, but it doesn't stop us from standing. If he stood, he will give us the grace to stand. If he went through it and really was successful at the end, he will give us the grace. He never fails his children. He is there for you. Sometimes you hear things that people say, like I was saying, someone was saying that God has disappointed him. Uh, hey, I don't know about you. How do you feel about God sometimes? Do you sometimes feel that he's disappointed you? Do you sometimes feel that God has not been too faithful? Hallelujah. There are times you think God is slow. Yeah, because I want this in this way. But God is delaying. Amen. Amen. But we don't know what is ahead. He never says that go ahead of me. He says follow me. If you follow him, he knows what is ahead. He knows when to, you know when the Israelites were taken out of Egypt and they were going to a pro, there were moments God would let them wait in one place for a very long time. They did not understand, but he understood why they had to really stay there. Amen. Amen. I, I remember the Lord telling Moses and the Israelites that if you go to the land, I will not take all the people at, at a go. We will really overcome them step by step, moment by moment. Because if we, the land is vast. You don't even understand. But if you, I take everyone off and I leave you, you will not be able to know the land. And you may be consumed by what is there. I also know that if you look at closely at um, David's life, when David was made king, he, when he was anointed king, he never sat on the throne for a long time. Saul was still there. When David started his life, when all his brothers were in town, in the city, at home with their father, he was in the wilderness. We may not understand our wilderness moments. He was with their sheep. But remember that he had to do a lot of warfare. He could only uh, defeat Goliath because of his testimony in the wilderness. If he had not faced that, he couldn't have faced Goliath. When he faced Goliath, he never said anything different. He said that, look, the God who saved me from these animals is able to give me victory. So even though you are come, they gave him the, I mean, Saul's... Uh, uh, armor, but they were even too much for him. Look, let me tell you, sometimes God wants us to overcome with very little things. Students, I know this may not sound too well for you, and I'm not really advocating that don't study. I want you to study, but sometimes you waste too much time. Sometimes you make it look like God doesn't really care. God can't do anything. So every morning, even when you read your Bible, say, hey, hey I'm busy. I, I'm going to write an exam. The 10 minutes, the 20 minutes, the 30 minutes that you are going to... Are you telling me that you didn't sleep last night? You could sleep. You could go and eat. You could cook and eat. How long does it take to cook and eat? Student, tell me. Daniela. How long does it take you to cook and eat? It takes a little bit of time. Like, how many minutes? Hello. 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 If it's maybe something like spaghetti, it could take like 30 minutes. Six minutes. 30. 30 minutes. Oh, wow. Even spaghetti takes 30 minutes. Spaghetti. Indomie. Okay, you make. Okay, all right. 
that's the easiest one. That alone takes 30 minutes. What about if you want to make yam and kontumri? How long would it take? Huh? An hour plus. Over an, hour. an hour plus. Okay, that, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't have that kind of uh, mathematics. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, but that's quite interesting. Okay, no, 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 I'm not done with it. How long would it take you to do your devotion in the morning? If you really want to do it, you can do it within 30 minutes or even... Within 30 minutes. minutes. So it's better than contemporary and yeah. Yet, how many times were you ready to, I mean, you were hungry and you said that I have an exam so I won't eat? But how many times would you say that I have an exam so I'm not reading my Bible? Do you know the reason we don't count the cost? You never even assessed it. The moment you say, and somebody, some unbeliever has told you that Christians fail exam because they are too Bible, Bible. No, it's not like that. They pass their exam. Yes, they do. Because you don't even understand what you are doing. If you understand, the same God that will give you wisdom to really study, understand what you study, and then really use it in your Christian life, he will not take that wisdom from you when you are done. When you sit behind your books, you're going to get it quick. Hallelujah. And, and unfortunately, you know, we, it, it's sad where we stand as Christians. We don't understand what we are doing. So I always hear Christians say, yeah, because, you, you see, I had lectures. And, 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 and I mean, I was in a hurry. So I couldn't read my Bible. What? You walked out of your room without reading your Bible? Because... But you ate breakfast. Hallelujah. I want us to really understand that if we are not careful, we will make decisions that will really cost us so much. Hallelujah. What am I trying to say this morning? We need to really understand that as Christians we'll go through certain things. But we need to prepare for them. Because if we don't, we are going to fail. And if you fail, it is your fault, but not God's fault. Hallelujah. Christians must begin to understand that there is a cost. There is a price to pay. If you are not ready to sacrifice, you will not be able to make it. You have to sacrifice. It's going to cost you something. Hallelujah. Okay, now let's go to Matthew chapter 21. I was just building up this for you to understand that when Jesus was going into Jerusalem, he knew what was ahead of him, yet he was willing to go. In coming to faith in Christ, you need to understand that there will be persecution, there will be challenges, but if you have made the uh, decision to follow him, you need to be willing and ready to go through whatever you have to go through. It's not going to be fun all through. It's not going to be like easy ride. There is going to be some bumps, there's going to be some challenges, but you have to be ready for it. Some come with a I mean, a wrong mindset, a wrong motive. But we'll see this morning. From verse 21. Matthew 21. Uh, From verse 1, sorry. So we all know that he says he's going. We know what he's going to face. But as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphag on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her called by her. Untie her, untie them, and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. It 
If anyone says anything to you, say that. <laughs> I don't know if you get it. Say what? Say it one more time. Am I hearing right? Need? So Jesus has a need? Jesus, Lord, need. Does he have any need? Do you have any need? Is it strange? You guys are still sleeping. Jesus has a need. We will have needs in our lives. I'm telling you, we will have needs. If he had a need, we will have needs. Do you rem remember that at the time Jesus needed to pay his taxes? Was he able to? Did he stop what he was doing? Hallelujah. Amen. Listen to me carefully. If you know the God you serve, he is the provider. And he's the one who does what? Supplies? He does what? Not your riches? Not your boss's riches? Not your friend's riches? According to whose riches? Everything belongs to who? The silver and gold? And he says that according to... Do you realize that he's so rich that he can afford to tar his road with gold? And if he promises you that I will supply according to my goodness. I, I, you know, do we really know the God we serve? Do we indeed know him? Are we here? And we saw Jesus had a need. And he didn't even worry about it. He said, go. He could see way ahead. And he could see there was a donkey and a colt there. He says, go and bring them. Do you realize that God could see ahead of Elijah? That there's a woman, a widow, who has the last bit of food to eat. And you need to get this right. You need to get this right. Hallelujah. Amen. All ye who are hungry, get this right. Amen. All ye who have needs, get this right. Amen. Now, this man Elijah... What fed, was fed three different times, three different circumstances of hunger, and he was fed three different times by God through different means to prove to us that he doesn't lack anything. At one point, he was fed by raven. Another time, by angel. But another time, how many times were you in need? Or how many times have you been in need? More than three. And if he could do it three times for someone, 
he will do it many, as many times for you. What we need to understand is that there would be a need. But there is a God who supplies according to his in glory in Christ Jesus. We need to know the kind of God we have come to. Because if we don't know when the need comes, we will make the wrong decisions and we'll go for wrong solutions. If you make a wrong decision to go for a wrong solution, what happens is that the result will be wrong. However, for Jesus to have a need, and you know, the way the Bible says it, he says that the Lord, Lord need. So the Lord has a need. So it's not wrong for me to have a need. Definitely I'll have a need. If he had a need, I will have a need. But how did he sort out sort that out? When he needed money to pay his taxes, he just told Peter, Peter, you know what? I'm not going to go with you. But I'm sending you. Take your line, go, throw the line. Don't look for two fishes. You don't need two fishes to pay your tax. Unless it's not coming from God. If it's coming from God, one fish can provide everything. If it's, if, look, he went. And you know, this was quite interesting that Peter has fished for a long time. And there is no time in his fishing career that he found money in the mouth of a fish. So the first thing to do was to question Jesus. How could this be? But remember, your experience with God today determines how you react tomorrow. Your experience, that is why I say to people, don't run away when there are crises in your walk with the Lord. Stand, face them. When he takes you through, you develop the capacity to handle the next one. If you run away, he who lives and he who fights and run away, lives to fight. So if you begin to run away from your fight, from the challenges that are coming your way, the one that is coming, you will not be able to. But when Peter met Jesus and Jesus borrowed his boat, watch this closely. He borrowed his boat to really have an evangelistic meeting. Hallelujah. And after he had shared the word, he knew that if you rent, listen, if you go and rent a place for preaching, pay the people. Jesus had to really take, you, you took somebody's boat, please. But Jesus didn't have money on him. He never, you know, I mean, this is, this is quite interesting. The guy never really had money on him. But he never had a need that couldn't be satisfied by his father. So he said, okay, I'm done with this meeting. Take your boat, but I can't let you go like that because I used your boat. And interestingly, I knew that the whole night you didn't get anything. So you, uh, you need something. Okay, just go a little bit further and cast your nets. I'm a professional fisherman. You're a preacher. It doesn't make sense. How can I get fish here? Look, I have toiled all night. Listen, you know, when you read the Bible, sometimes be careful or pay attention to the choice of words. How many times have you toiled? He says, we've worked hard. Another verse, he says, we've toiled all night and haven't caught anything. What you are saying doesn't really make sense. But, nevertheless, at thy word, 
I will, I will let down the net. And at his word, Peter let down the net. And what does the Bible say? And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. They got so much. The whole night, they did everything right by the book. Yet, they didn't get anything. Now, by faith, he throws a net. You guys don't get it. Look, you, you don't get it. And when you have this experience, you know what breaks my heart? We are able to testify of what God has done today. But the next challenge that comes, we behave as if God has never done anything for us. The God that did it yesterday is going to do it today. So when he really, Peter have had this experience with Jesus. So the next time Jesus said, go, this time don't go with a net. Go with a line and uh, hook and line. Whatever you want to call it. I don't, I mean, I'm not a fisherman, so I don't even know. I've never gone fishing before. Who's going to take me fishing anyway? We have one here? Yeah. All right, okay. But he went. When Jesus said, go, this time, go with a line, and the first fish you catch, open its mouth. There's money in it. He never wasted one second because he's seen it done before. You know, your experience with God today builds up your faith for tomorrow. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing. The more you read the Bible, the more you get deep into the Bible, you see what he's done for people, you begin to see what he's doing in your life, and you are able to face tomorrow. Because nothing, nothing will really scare you any longer. So this time, he didn't say anything. He just went. And Bible says that indeed, when he opened, when he, the first fish that he caught, opened it, the money was there. Hallelujah. Amen. Why am I saying this? Jesus had a need to pay his taxes, and he paid them. I don't know the kind of need that is in your life, but I want you to understand that he's ready to help you fulfill that need. He's going to provide for you. He's going to make sure that you get it. I don't, you know, sometimes we make it look like God is able to do some things, but not some things. No, God is able to do everything. But he's going to do it according to his will. Not what you will. Hallelujah. He is going to do it, but he's going to do it according to his will, according to his timing. We need to have patience for him. We need to know him to know. You know, there are certain times I just really ask myself, do Christians really understand the Bible? Because we are, we are quick to quote. Yeah, you see, the Lord... Our God is ready as we pray to give us everything. But do we know that it's according to his will? If we pray according to his will, we will get everything that we ask for. Now, the question is that what you asked, was it according to his will? What, what you are blaming God that he didn't do for you? Did you, in fact, was it according to his will? Hallelujah. Because if we did not ask according to his will, and some of the needs that we really, in fact, motives even count. Motives count. Because in James, he tells us that motives are a reason we don't get what we want. Because he says that, you ask and you never get because you ask with wrong motives to satisfy your... And we know that somebody in the Bible was so rich. I mean, he planted, he got so much. But then he decided to spend it, not according to God's will, what had come in. He said, I'm taking an early retirement. I'm going to really enjoy the fruit of my labor. I worked hard for it. I've gotten all this. I'm not going to work again. I'm going to enjoy it. And Bible says that 
But uh, Jesus, uh, I mean, Jesus said, the Lord said, you fool, I will take your life away from you tonight. Now, not because of anything, but because when you are thinking about what you have got, you never thought about God. That doesn't mean that he wasn't going to give the money to God. But did he know that God wanted to distribute that wealth to people? He didn't know. Did he know whether maybe God wanted him to go and then look for orphans and give to them? I don't know. Maybe widows? I don't know. But the point is that he didn't check with God. Hallelujah. You are blessed. We thank God that you are blessed. But have you checked with God what to do with a blessing? Do you know why he gave it to you? Do you know why you are where you are? Do you know why you are in the position you are today? Do you know why you are in the school you are today? Do you know why you are in the hall you are today? Because there are many halls. Why are you in that particular hall? There are many people in the school. Why are these people your roommates? Do you know why they are with you? Have you checked with God? Hallelujah. Beloved, I want us to really begin to check on things just to make sure we are in line with what God wants us to do. Because we can make all kinds of decisions without checking with God and we would be in error. And many of us are in error. Many of us are doing things. You know, there are times in your life you have a need that you think that it's really, but it could be the way God wants you to make a sacrifice. Hallelujah. Because there are times that there are challenges. I shared with some group, uh, I don't know, maybe on Wednesday. I shared with a group something about my own life, about how uh, seriously I I got to work on a certain project. And um, everything was negative for me. And I was a Christian. I'd come to the Lord fresh and I was so really madly in love with him and I would make like decisions that would look like I was crazy. And there was uh, an opportunity that I was denied. And I felt bad about it. I was so angry about it. And uh, it affected my performance. It affected almost everything in my life because I just felt that, look, I shouldn't be treated in that way. But I prayed about it, and God really rebuked me sharply. He rebuked me. He said, I can sit down and complain and not do what I have to do to end even the little that I said was small. (laughs) Do you know that it happens to us? We, we tend to now begin to complain. And then when we go to the office, yeah, but you see me, they promoted some, and it was about promotion as well, so I mean, don't worry about that. I mean, I felt so I, 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 I should have been, and then somebody, you know, you know that kind of workplace stuff? Yeah, okay. Right, so I was really angry about it, and uh, God said, look, you can complain as much as you want to complain and sit down and do nothing. And still come to me and pray. And I was praying about it. And God said that your laziness, when I, the day I will visit you, I will see your laziness sitting down there complaining and doing nothing. And I will really tell you that you don't even deserve what you are giving. So you better get up and do what you're supposed to do. And now, come to me and talk. I'll come and visit. And when I see that you are doing more than what you deserve, I mean, you are giving less than what you deserve, I will now make a way for you. And that's exactly what happened. I said, yes, sir. And I began to do without complaining again. It healed my heart, and I was okay. I was comfortable doing whatever. I mean, not comfortable, comfortable, because it was still painful. But... (laughs) But I had understood what God was saying and I wouldn't complain. I will do what I have to do. And I did whatever. And out of that, I'm standing here today. Out of that, I don't have time for the full story. Maybe one day I'll tell you the full story. But what I'm trying to say is that we tend to complain because we are not um, 
we, we don't stay in touch with him. And God is looking for a way to bless us, but we are not ready for that blessing. Hallelujah. So we need to, all of us, we need to really come to that point and know the will of God. Hallelujah. Because God saw me complaining and struggling and everything, but I was not praying according to his will. But when he warned me, when he reprimanded me, when he rebuked me, and I stayed in line, what he brought to me. And mind you, if I had really had what I thought I should have had, I wouldn't be standing here today. I wouldn't be in the position I am today. I'm telling you. So sometimes the things that we feel are bad for us, God is still in control. I'm not saying that God intentionally made it happen like that. Because God, I don't think God will let anyone cheat on me. Amen. Amen. But the enemy will take advantage of a situation and God will turn it out for your good. And he turned it out for my good. Hallelujah. So we need to come to that kind of understanding as we walk with him. Jesus knew everything. Yet he had a need. He had a power but he had a need as well. And he made sure that his people know that he also had a need. Hmm. So he gave them instructions. Tell them the Lord needs. Hallelujah. And Bible says that, let's move on. But God said, Okay, right. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. You know, a prophecy had to be fulfilled. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and a colt, the fall of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed. Sometimes we just have to really obey. Hey, but what about if the man says he won't give it to us? Shut up and go. If Jesus said it, I said, do what? Shut up and go. They went. And they saw what they saw. Exactly what he had said. And the person gave it to him, uh, to them, when they said what Jesus, the answer, they gave the answer. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their clothes on them for Jesus to sit on. Hallelujah. Amen. And we get into dangerous places. Hallelujah. Hmm. They brought. Put stuff on it. Jesus sat. They put some stuff on the road. They were all fine. Hallelujah. And not a small crowd followed him. A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Hallelujah. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hallelujah. 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 Up to this time, they have done everything right. Physically, everything was being done right. Prophecy has to be fulfilled. And prophecy was being fulfilled. But there was a wrong motive there. Beloved in the Lord, You may have the crowd following you, but for what reason? Why are they after you? Why are they supporting you? Why are they shouting, praising, praising? They said the right words. Hosanna. Hosanna means save now. And they needed a savior because they were under uh, uh, the Romans. And they wanted a savior. And they knew 
that this is a savior and he's coming to save us. Indeed, Jesus was their savior. But they looked at it wrongly. They thought he was a political savior. So up till this time, they are still waiting for a Messiah. Up till today. They still don't see Jesus as the Messiah. You know, people say things. And, and it's, not, it's not easy to say certain things. Especially in this season as a preacher. But it's a reality. I said it's what? There could be the crowd, but why are they there? Why are they there? The crowd may be there for the wrong reasons. In this case, they were there for the wrong reasons. And that is why it was easy for them for the Pharisees to deceive them and the same people who said Hosanna turned around to say crucify him. Because their expectations were not met. If you came to Christ, you know why people begin to, today's Christian, we, we are not grounded and we keep, um, like if you, if you are a farmer or you have, uh, you have any knowledge in agriculture, shifting cultivation. You know how people move? Uh, they plant here today, the next day they plant in somewhere, they plant in somewhere. People begin, if they don't know why they are here, and they have the wrong, mo- oh my goodness, hear this, and they, <laughs> is it the right place to say this? Okay, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> Let's hear this. Do you know that people come to church with, their, with wrong motives and they want the preacher to meet that, that motive they came with? They come, they flood the place, but with the wrong intentions, with the wrong motives, Yes, they've come to church. They didn't come to kill anyone. But what they wanted is not what is being preached. And because of that, they want to really use their influence to twist the pastor to preach according to what they want, according to their own gospel. If the pastor begins to preach something that really gets them to set up, they gang up against him. Scary, but true. Unfortunately, some of us really look at the people and we begin to stay away from certain parts of the Bible. Because it will offend the people. We want to tell them what their itching ears want to hear. We want them to hear what will make them comfortable in their sin. So we begin to throw away what God wants us to preach. And we want to preach to them to make them comfortable. Did it happen to Jesus? Yes, of course. Let's go to John chapter 6. Hallelujah. 26 and 27. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, 
but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And this is when Jesus was speaking about his flesh, that they have to eat his flesh and all that. And the people, that's not what they want. They had followed him. And these were multitudes. These were crowds that in his time could be, if, if it's today and today's population, there could be millions of people following him. Because if, look, in his time, the population was very small. So if you get 5,000 people following you, it's like probably today's, how many people? Maybe 10 million or more. Hallelujah. And he had all these people, and Jesus was ready to tell them the truth. Even though they got angry, even though they didn't like it, even though they were offended, Jesus was, was able to tell them that I know why you follow me. Do you know why people follow you? Whether, whether in your life, do you, in fact, do you know why that guy wants you? Do you know why, I mean, that lady wants you to marry her? Eh? Do you know why you have that kind of number in your church? Have you checked the temperature of the church? Have you checked how people live? Because sometimes they are there for the wrong reasons. Sometimes the reason they are following, like the people that follow Jesus. Hallelujah. I want you to read the whole of John 6. I don't have time to do that, but let's go to verse 66. Let's do 60 to 66 to give it a little bit of... Uh... He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Okay, yeah. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Listen to me carefully. The teaching, even if the teaching is hard... Preacher, preach it. Member of the congregation, sit in. Because that's, if that's what Jesus, because Jesus' teaching is hard. Why is Jesus' teaching hard? Moses said, if somebody slaps you, do what? Hmm? He slaps you. What do you have to do? You turn the other one? Eye for eye. Tooth for Whatever, yeah. So if someone slaps you, you turn the other one. You give, you give him the other one or you, you slap him back. You slap him back. Okay. That's Moses. Let's hear Jesus. Let's see who's teaching his heart here. Moses says that when someone slaps you, give him a harder one. What does Jesus say? When someone slaps you, which one is harder? Which one? Jesus' is one? Oh, wow. Okay, let's see this one. <laughs> I know this one you don't like, but I didn't make it up. It's in the Bible. Okay. If you commit fornication or adultery, in that time, it was you physically having that affair. True or false? Be, I mean, getting yourself actually involved in the act. Now, Jesus says, how many of us have looked lustfully? Men, women, wherever. Now, he says that if you now look lustfully, You have already committed it. Hallelujah. Now, which one is harder? So why do people... Listen, Jesus is teaching not cheap. Not cheap. If you want some cheap teaching, go find it somewhere else. Not in Jesus' church. Jesus will tell you the truth. As hard as it may be. I mean, I don't know. Hallelujah. So... On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Those who want to accept it can accept it. I heard that his disciples were grumbling about this. Jesus said to them, does this offend you? This one? Does it offend you? Then what if you... <laughs> Hallelujah. This offends you? 
Then, what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of... Yet, there are some of you who do not believe. Listen, some people came to Christ not because of spiritual things, but because of fleshly things, worldly things. Hallelujah. Jesus is not going to give you what you want. He's going to give you what will help you. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled me. Now verse 66, I mean, really (laughs) puts an end to it. From this time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. If you are afraid to tell, if you are going to tell people the truth, they're going to really turn back and go away. Because many have come to Christ with the wrong motives. Many have come to Christ with, with all kinds of thoughts in their mind, thinking that he's Father Christmas. He is not, please. Father Christmas wears some kind of wig. He's out there wearing some kind of clothes and some wig and just trying to deceive you, making you think that he comes from chimneys. Please! <laughs> Jesus is not coming through your chimney. Hallelujah. Don't, you know, we get things wrong. We have to be told the truth. Hallelujah. Truth will hit you hard. It will hit you hard. But if you are able to stand till the end. Hallelujah. The truth about the cross hits Jesus himself hard. And he became sorrowful. And he could go to his father and say, I know you sent me for this, but where we are, can you let this cup, please? You know, you know the interesting thing? He didn't even answer. Did he? He didn't say anything. You know, there are times when you go to your father and you say things, he looks at you, he doesn't say anything, but you walk away. Knowing the answer. (laughs) Hallelujah. He will look at your face. And he's sitting there reading his newspaper. Give me something to read. Okay. So I'm reading my newspaper. Son, come. This one. Don't worry about this one. Let you do whatever you want to do. Yeah. And you tell me something. What's your need? Yeah. You, you give him some, give him a mic. Come tell me that nah, this is what, okay, yeah, say something. You people, give, give, her, give mm-hmm. her this mic. Okay, okay, yeah, it's mm-hmm. okay, working. Yeah. I want a million dollars. Okay. <laughs> so I'm reading my newspaper, and then he comes. Call me, Daddy, yeah, yeah. Very good morning. I want a million dollars. Where is he? Did I say anything to him? You don't have to say anything. They know the answer. (laughs) You know, I look at him. (laughs) I I keep on reading my newspaper like he doesn't exist. (laughs) And he got the answer. So he walked away. (laughs) Hallelujah. There are times... The father didn't say anything to him. He heard him. And Bible says that he heard him. That's what the Bible says. He said that he went with Christ and he heard him. Bible says that he was so sorrowful. When he went, in Gethsemane, it wasn't easy. But look, I'm telling you, your Gethsemane, and I've said it many times, your Gethsemane will prepare you for your Calvary. Because if you don't go through Gethsemane, or if you fail at Gethsemane, you fail at Calvary. And if you fail at Calvary, the crown is not for you. Because Bible says in Hebrews, he says that, he, go to Hebrews chapter 12, Bible verse 2. He said that, fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He endured, the, you see, 
Calvary was because a decision was made at Gethsemane. So Calvary really propelled him to sit at the right hand side of the father. But before Calvary, there was Gethsemane. Hallelujah. The Gethsemane, let me tell you today, Gethsemane is the moment of decision. Because if you make the right decision, I am telling you that there is, when Jesus made the, the father didn't say anything, but he understood. And that decision was made. So when, after that, they beat him, they spat on him, they did everything, he did not care. He went through it and went to Calvary, went on the cross, died, was buried, came out of the grave, went up, sat at the Father's right hand. Hallelujah. Because he knew, Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Bible never says he enjoyed the cross. Listen to me, you will not enjoy the moment of Calvary. It's not a moment of enjoyment. It's painful. It's, it's, it could be struggling. I mean, you could go through anything but enjoy it. Because if you are going to really enjoy the crown, you have to endure the cross. Should I close? It looks like you don't get it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. And then, let me fi- finish. Go back uh, to uh, ch- verse 9. I- I'm just going to finish because it looks like you're not ready for this. Okay. The crowd that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They were all the right words, but they were said, they, these words were spoken by the people with the wrong uh, reasoning. Because Jesus says that you do what? With what? But they didn't understand what they were doing. They thought, they knew the scripture in uh, Zechariah 9 9. They knew it. They went through it. They went through the, what they needed, but they didn't understand what they were doing. Hallelujah. So, um, yeah, just let's move on. <laughs> when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Now, this is where I'm going to end this morning sermon. Who is this? Who is this? I said, who is this? These people, this large crowd, not large, very large, very large crowd. You know we have XL and we have XXL. Okay, so this is not large crowd, but very large crowd. This very large crowd that followed Jesus were saying the right things. Now they get into the city of Jerusalem, and it stirs up the city. And people begin to ask, who is this? Now the people who were shouting uh, um, the Hosanna seriously did not have a full understanding of who he is. They had a partial understanding of who Jesus is. Because when they were asked, who is this? I, from this question and the answer they gave, I'm not surprised they later on said crucify him. Listen to the answer they, I mean, they, they gave. The crowd answered, this is Jesus. It's true. The prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. It's true. But that's not the full picture. He's the Messiah. They miss that one. They miss that one. Many people are in church. They have accepted Christ as their Lord, uh, as their Savior. That's real. the reality. But they don't accept him as their Lord. You have a partial understanding of who he is and about your own salvation. You see, when you come to him, yes, he's your Savior. He saved us by what he did on the cross. But that doesn't end the story. Hallelujah. This, the next part of the story is that he is supposed to be your Lord. And when someone is your Lord, you obey him. Are you living in obedience to him? 
So these people knew him. If you don't live in obedience to him, it's easy for you to be deceived. That's why many of us are living in deception. Because we had a partial knowledge of who he is. We did not have the full picture. And because we don't have the full picture, and these people did not have the full picture. So when someone else came and said other things to them, the Pharisees came and really deceived them. They accepted. They said, now crucify him. Were they not the same people who said, Hosanna? If you have a partial knowledge of who Jesus is, if you have a partial knowledge of why you are in Christ or why you came to Christ, you know, the full thing in Christ is that when you came to him, you have to follow him. You don't go ahead of him. When you come to him, he says that, you know, some people came, they call themselves believers, but I want to really mess you up this morning. You are a believer. I believe it. I accept it. But you have to progress to be a disciple. Because Bible says that these guys... The people, the believers who were seen in Antioch in Pisidia, they were living their life like Jesus. And the people saw and they said that, ooh, they live like Jesus and they call them Christians. How many of us are believers but we are not Christians? Because Christians are not just believers. Hallelujah. I said Christians are not just believers. Hallelujah. And do you know why I say so? That believing alone doesn't make it? That's what James 2.19 says. Hallelujah. You believe there's one God? You believe? So it makes you a believer? You believe that there is one God? Good. You've done very well. Clap for yourself. Yeah, but demons also believe. So some of us... We are the same level with demons. We don't progress to the next stage. We believe. Yes, it's fine. You've done well. You believe. But you don't stop there. You move on. You grow. Yeah, you see, the point I'm trying to make this morning is for us to understand who is Jesus in your life. Who is this? Who is this? What answer will you give? That's my theme for this morning. Who is this? I, I, I reserved it for the last. You know, normally I say the team at, the, at, at first. But this time I reserved it for last. Hallelujah. Who is this? Who is this man in your life? This man called Jesus. Who is he to you? Who is he in your life? How are you walking with him? What answers will you give? Who is this? Who is this? You know, they, they really stirred up an excitement in Jerusalem. But the people in Jerusalem came out of their houses. They came to the streets. They saw a crowd following Jesus. They saw Jesus. They, I mean, but who is this? You are following him. Who is he? Bible says that you have to give an answer. Hallelujah. Who is this? Who is he in your life? You can, who did you come to? Some people come to church because of the pastor. If you came to church because of me, you failed. Oh, you failed, you failed, you failed. Seriously. You're on your way to hell. If you came to church because of me, if I do anything here that points to me, I'm in error. Everything I do here must point to So who is he? I said, who is he? To you. Remember, at the beginning of this year, the Lord says something to this church. He says, know your God. This year, make every effort to know your God. I said, make every effort to know the God that you serve. Many of us have, because Jesus said, look, These people, they followed me because of food. Are you here because of what you can get? 
Maybe you are sick and you need healing. That's why you are in church. He heals, but that's not, the, that's not all that he does. Maybe you want to pass your exam. So now you are getting, because exam is coming. So you are getting serious with God. That he will help you to pass your exam. That's good. He will help you to pass your exam. But that's not the end. I've seen people who God blessed, who didn't know they can even write the exam. We prayed. We asked them to study. They prayed. They studied. They prayed. They passed the exam. They are not here anymore. Yeah. They thought they were going to fail. In fact, after the exam, they said, indeed, we have failed. I said, you haven't failed. They said, you don't know what I wrote. This is not the first time I'm writing this paper. I've written it before. I know what I wrote at that time, yet I failed. Today, what I wrote. If I failed last time, this time I'll fail double. <laughs> and I said, no, don't, 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 don't beat yourself like that. Let's trust the Lord. Let's pray. And we prayed. And they passed. If you came to pass your exam, when you pass, you will leave. Yeah. Why are you here? Why did you come to him? Some people come to Christ because they want wives, husbands. They want money. They want cars. They want whatever. It's all fine. Yeah, he, he blesses his children. But is that the reason you are here? Is that the reason you came to Christ? Who is this? I said, who is this? You thought today I was going to say some Hosanna thing. Who is this? Who is this? How you answer this question will determine your relationship with him. The way they answered, they said he was a prophet. He was, he's Jesus. He's a prophet. They were all true. But that was not a full picture. They couldn't get a full picture. So it was easy for them the next weekend, probably weekend, no, maybe two days, two days later, they were, it was so easy for them to say, crucify him. I'm done. You need to answer that question for yourself.